Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope that everybody's having a great start to their Wednesday morning. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started, and thank you all for joining today. Again, my name is Donna Wright with the ABLE Trust, and before we get started today, just a couple of housekeeping notes. We are recording this webinar, and we're going to make sure that it's available on our website just shortly after we finish up today. Um, we're going to be utilizing the Q&A feature today, so throughout today's webinar, if you have questions for any of us at the ABLE Trust, for Jim, um, for anybody that you're going to hear from today, please go ahead and make sure to use the Q&A feature, and we'll be sure to get to your questions. Um, if for any reason today we, if for any reason today we don't get to your questions, we will be sure to follow up with you personally. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I think, are our slides up? Let me see, for some reason I'm not seeing my slides. Bear with me for a technical, um, just a second here. All right, so good morning again. I hope that you've grabbed a cup of ambition. We have been having such a wonderful time here at the ABLE Trust this month. It is Disability Employment Awareness Month, and this is our fourth and final webinar Wednesday. Um, this year, when we were thinking about Disability Employment Awareness Month, we were really inspired by the lyrics from the Dolly Parton song, Nine to Five, when Dolly Parton speaks of waking up and having that cup of ambition every morning. And here at the ABLE Trust, we believe that everyone, um, regardless of their ability, deserves to have that cup of coffee in the morning, cup of tea, whatever it is, on the way to work or at work. So we have been having an incredible time this month. And um, as you can see, we've had some fun with um, a lot of our partners across the state. Here's a picture of just a few of the folks that we've been sharing cups of ambition with across the state. Um, hopefully you've been following us on social media and you've seen some of these. We've got a few more days left in the month and we hope that you will grab a, a cup of ambition, tag us on your favorite social media, share it and let us know that you support disability inclusion. Um, as well, Deem, as we call it, would not be possible without the help of some incredible sponsors. Um, our work at the ABLE Trust in disability employment is our work all year long. October is the month that we really get to celebrate big. And without the folks that you see on our screen here, we none of this you know, would, would be possible. Um, I did wanna take a moment just to say, you know, speaking of sponsors, um, that we want to recognize that while we are celebrating this month, there are a lot of folks in the state of Florida who have not been able to celebrate due to Hurricane Ian. And we have been thinking of them, thoughts and prayers, and sending our support in any way possible. One of our sponsors, um, Florida Power and Light Next Era Energy, um, has been working around the clock, and we'd like to share a little bit of their efforts with you right now. Hurricane Ian made landfall, tied as the fifth most powerful storm ever to hit the United States. This was totally terrifying. I called my aunt to tell my children I love them. It was relentless, powerful beyond what many of us have experienced in our lifetimes. But to the fullest extent possible, we were ready, hoping for the best, prepared for the worst. And when the wind and rain finally calmed, our crews got moving. We hit the ground and sky with everything we had, working long days, sleepless nights, to help restore what Ian so suddenly took away. Many leaving behind their families to help their Florida neighbors. From all of us at FPL, we thank you. We know it's not easy to be without power. We appreciate your patience and your kindness as we restore, rebuild, and recover from Hurricane Ian together. After all, that's what Floridians do. 
Um, again, we just appreciate Florida Power and Light. We appreciate all of our sponsors and we are confident that as always, Florida will continue to prosper. Um, before we get into some of our speakers, um, most of you that are joining us today are very familiar with the ABLE Trust, but just in case, I wanted to share a little bit about who we are and what our work is. Um, the ABLE Trust was actually created by the Florida Legislature a little over 30 years ago to be the direct support organization for vocational rehabilitation in Florida. We were created to be a stable and growing financial resource to provide planning, research, and policy development for disability employment in Florida. It is our role at the ABLE Trust to identify the most effective and efficient means for increasing employment for Floridians with disabilities and to work with the Florida Department of Education, the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, VR, and many other partners to fund and fully implement solutions that will bring us closer to full employment for Floridians with disabilities. Over the next 30 years, we aim to have our mission be a little bit even more focused on supporting Floridians, supporting businesses with recruiting, hiring, and retaining persons with disabilities in the workforce. Um, and so as we move forward in our mission, um, we have some data to share with you it probably will not come to a surprise to most of you on that are joining us today that there is a workforce participation gap in the state of Florida for persons with disabilities of about 40%. Here at the ABLE Trust, we find this to be unacceptable and it's our goal to close this gap with our partners across the state. Um, this gap has persisted for more than 40 years. And we believe through research, capacity building and outreach that we can find solutions for more people to be employed in Florida. So we have set forth a vision here at the ABLE Trust. And this is our vision. This is a goal of the ABLE Trust. It's not VR's goal, it's not APD's goal, but it's our commitment to working with our partners and stakeholders across the state to ensure more Floridians with disabilities are in the workforce and close that gap. We are calling this Inclusive Florida, powered by the ABLE Trust, and this is our strategic plan. This is our roadmap for closing this gap. We are positioning ourselves as the state leader for disability employment, and we believe that through Inclusive Florida, the ABLE Trust can identify breakthrough innovations grounded in data and research that will result in an additional 300,000 Floridians with disabilities in our workforce to be employed in the next 10 years. As I mentioned, one of these circles that you see here, we aim to lead with data. We will continue to provide um, statewide research data analysis and be that thought leader who shares data, not just economic data, but research and evidence-based practices that will help build capacity within disability employment between our systems and our stakeholders. Another one of the circles that you see here is outreach. It is an incredibly important component. This is one of the components that we're experiencing here today. Through outreach, we'll be working with our stakeholders across the state of Florida, including employers, educators, career service providers, um, elected officials, community leaders, and all of this to raise awareness, but most importantly, to build connections and collaborations. The final circle that you see here is building capacity. We know that businesses want to learn from other businesses, and we aim to find solutions that we can scale to meet the needs of businesses, large and small, and across industry sectors. One of the programs at the ABLE Trust that we believe is showing successful implementation of all three um, that, of the circles that you see here is Florida High School High Tech. Um, this is a program that is developed to help students with disabilities explore career and education and workforce training opportunities after high school. It's a program that we are incredibly proud of. This program has evolved into a program that not only gets the students 
to graduation that also helps the students explore career and workforce education training opportunities after high school. We're really excited to say that nine, the high school graduation rate for students with disabilities that are in the Florida High School High Tech Program is 99%, and many of those students are moving on to post-secondary education. As you can see here, our high school high tech program spans much of the state uh, from the Panhandle all the way down to Miami. Um, I could continue to talk about how great this program is, but I really want to encourage you to go to our website and, and learn more about this um, and find ways to get engaged. All right, so now it's time for the good stuff. Um, today, you really are in for a treat. Um, the presentation that you're going to hear today uh, from Jim is going to be not only thought provoking, um, but hopefully will leave you with questions. It will leave you with ideas on how we can work together, um, how we can continue to help Floridians with disabilities find their place in the workforce. Um, just another quick reminder that if you have questions, please share them through the Q&A feature. Um, as I also mentioned early, we are really passionate about our relationships with our partners, and I'd really like to take a moment and introduce one of those partners now, um, Tina Pepin. Tina Pepin is with the Pepin, um, is the, actually the executive director of the Pepin Family Foundation. Um, I could brag about her and all of her areas of expertise in philanthropy, community outreach, um, but uh, I think that hearing from her will speak for itself. Um, she also assumes at Pepin Family Foundation the role of secretary for Pepin Academies, and the ABLE Trust is very fortunate to work with Pepin Academies through our Florida High School High Tech program um, as they are a charter school working with uh, a service provider in the Tampa Bay area. Um, her most recent passion project includes being part founder of the Mental Health for Heroes Foundation, which is a wellness program designed to meet the needs of first responders and their families, which I think is incredibly cool. Um, Tina, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk a little bit about your work and introduce our speaker today. Yes, thank you, Donna. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to address you guys. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Tina Pepin. I have the pleasure of being the director of the Pepin Family Foundation. Um, in that work that I do, I support our family's legacy of philanthropy in Tampa Bay, but we have entities of Pepin Heart Hospital, which is under the Advent Health System, as well as Pepin Academies, our not-for-profit public charter school. Uh, back in uh, 1999, our family founded Pepin Academies, serving students in the third through 12th grade with specific learning or learning related disabilities. Since then, we've grown from one campus in Tampa to our second in Riverview and third in Newport Ritchie, serving about 1,200 students. As full-time ESE centers, our students um, enrolled in schools must have an individualized education plan, an IEP. Um, it is our belief that uh, the students at Pepin Academies can attain the highest of academic standards if they are given the chance to demonstrate their knowledge um, in an appropriate and accepting setting. And I do believe that goes for any anyone with any disability. Um, they just need the right tools and, and environment and people around them to succeed. We do this by uh, utilizing a therapeutic educational model, which combines the standard Florida curriculum as well as delivered by teachers who are duly certified. So they might have their specific content area and ESC, including speech language pathology, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and this is all comes at no cost to our students. Um, so our students started graduating with standard diplomas uh, successfully, uh, but then we realized as ABLE Trust did that sometimes they need some extra help. Um, this is when we decided to expand and open our transition program in 2012 where students can receive instruction in career exploration, career prep, social emotional functioning, self-advocacy, et cetera, all the characteristics that we want them to have before they accept a job offer. Uh, Pepin's workforce transition program is for students aged 18 to 22. 
uh, this program flips the classroom experience a bit to focus on experimental learning. So students are at job sites four days a week and in the classroom one day a week uh, where they still receive those counseling services. Um, currently, we have 70 students this year in our program, and we have been growing exponentially in our partnerships as, as the stigma has become broken. We have partners with Public Defender's Office under Julianne Holt, Embassy Suites, Chick-fil-A, Macy's, Advent Health Tampa, Tampa General, many more. Um, from organizing and inputting data, um, hands-on culinary activities, maintenance, and more, we focus not only on our students learning job skills, but job-related skills. So things that some of us may take for granted and maybe wish that our current employees would relearn, like showing up on time, communicating effectively with our coworkers, solving workplace problems, advocating for themselves to cultivate that independence, um, but just giving them the tools to allow them to be productive members in our in the company and society. Um, so this brings me to the clear uh, connection with Able Trust. Um, we share this mission to provide young adults with all types of disabilities at the opportunity and resources to succeed in the workplace and beyond. Um, I think that's why we're all here today. I am personally very excited to be here today to continue this conversation, um, but I'm also honored to introduce an industry expert who embodies this mission every single day. As you know, and please correct me if I pr pronounce this wrong, Jim Sinaki is no stranger to advocating for those with disabilities. Jim has a 40 year history with disability inclusion strategies since 1976 when he joined the IBM Corporation. At the age of 25, Jim sustained a spinal cord injury that was the catalyst for his advocacy for the abilities of people with disabilities. At IBM, Jim served as the corporate communications director for IBM diversity workforce communications organization, it's a mouthful, working with disability advocates to ensure that the company was a leader in technology and employer of choice for this disabled community. After retirement in 2016, he joined JP Morgan Chase as their first head of disability inclusion worldwide. While spreading awareness, Jim, alongside his coworkers, senior execs, he established policies and strategies that provided all accommodations and necessary accessibilities to support employees with disabilities. Jim says, full assimilation requires leadership with the will, commitment, and attitude to train professionals with disabilities for leadership positions, just as we do with mainstream employees. He has professionals with disabilities for leadership positions, and he has worked for decades to bring inclusivity into the workplace while transforming the culture of awareness, helping able-bodied people be more comfortable with people who may be different, especially ones with disabilities. So in all of the free time that he has not had, Jim has served on many boards that are dedicated to fighting these stigmas, advancing opportunities. He has also continued to actively spread awareness through his blog, dedicated to educating his community. And I hope that's okay that I'm shouting it out because I did some reading. Um, it's called View from the Chair and some titles include empowering these people with disabilities to become leaders. He doesn't say that we should be handing out jobs to those who don't have the skill but we do need to give everyone the opportunity to earn their way, a very fond mission of mine. We are now facing a much more inclusive future because of tenacious leaders like Jim Sanaki. Jim, I would like to take this opportunity again to thank you for your years of servicing this community and for speaking up for people who just have not found their voice yet. So, Right now, I am honored today to introduce today's speaker, and please correct my pronunciation, Jim Sinaki. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, Jim Sinaki is right. Perfect. Uh, so 
Uh, I'm Jim Sinaki, um, uh, formerly with J.P. Morgan Chase and the IBM Corporation. I've been uh, involved with disability inclusion for a long time, uh, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. But today, I want to share with you my construct around disability inclusion. And what I've tried to do for the majority of my life is make able-bodied people feel comfortable with engaging people with disabilities. And so on this agenda slide, you'll see where I talk about family. I talk about disability and aliens because sometimes people don't look at us as, I don't know, colleagues or anything like that because we have a, a disability. Some of the issues about uh, going shopping with people and, and normalizing themselves. We'll talk about statistics, some of the numbers, um, my 80-20 rule for people with disabilities in terms of engagement in the marketplace, uh, what not to say to a person with a disability when you think you're saying the right things, some guidance around the five A's that makes it uh, easier to talk about how to engage uh, a disability program or people with disability, embracing the new era of disability inclusion, owning your disability if you are uh, a person with a disability and how to act, um, et cetera. And so let's go to the next slide. So what I really like to talk about in, in my life is my family, as many of us do as well. And the issue here is that we really have more in common with able-bodied people than not. My wife is able-bodied. Um, uh, we've been married. It's going to be 34 years next month. And uh, in the middle there, I, that's my wife, my son, Jimmy, my daughter, Danielle, and myself in the wheelchair. Um, my daughter's an attorney. Um, my wife and I met at IBM, uh, where we were both working together. And my son, Jimmy, uh, uh, graduated from Northeastern College with a, a master's degree. And he went to work for the Defense Department. And he's a great kid. And when I asked him what he did for work, he said, Dad, if I tell you, I'll have to kill you. So um, we live a normal life, as many of us do, you know, whatever our normals are. But we're, we're pretty much the same as you. And on, on the right of, of the screen here, I was injured in a surfing accident in Puerto Rico when I was 25 years old. Um, I was a lifeguard at Reese Park in uh, New York. I worked for two and a half years at the beach. I was a, a pool lifeguard. I was, I was a swimmer at Colgate University. I got my scholarships at Colgate, got my degree from NYU as a master's program, but broke my neck body surfing while we were training the city college swimming team on an event and that kind of uh, jettisoned me into a, a, a little bit of despair and a life of disability inclusion. And that's why I'm here to share um, what my life was like and to normalize disability inclusion with us. So, you know, I wanna emphasize this, as you can see, I have, I have the same issues you do with family and we live a quote unquote normal life with me in a wheelchair coping as best we can. And I think we've done a pretty good job as a family. Next slide, please. Um, when I've engaged people, uh, normal people in my life, uh, including at IBM and at uh, JP Morgan Chase, uh, Able-bodied people sometimes walk up to me or a disabled person and sort of like think of us as aliens, right? We have to remember that we are part of humanity. Something happened to us at birth or in my case, later in life at, in an accident. And that doesn't make us non-human. It just makes us different. And it's how we cope with our disabilities that really uh, hits the mark for me and everybody else. And so when you meet a person with a disability, the question is, how do you approach a person with a disability? Well, you could start by saying hello. 
introducing yourself, um, telling a little bit about yourself. And I would do the same with you. And I usually tell people right away when I meet them, I, I can't use my hands. My, my fingers are folded up uh, in a fist. And when I shake hands, I said, I can pound you. So I can, you know, give you a pound fist to fist. And we go on from there. And what do you say to me? How about good morning? Hey, do you want to go for coffee? The, you know, the conversations are the same with disabled people. And it's always uh, okay to ask the questions to say, you know, how can I help you when we get to a door? Um, what can I do for you? What, what should I know? That kind of thing. And I'm not afraid to tell people about my accent and let them know, uh, because in some, in, in some areas, people are, are afraid that they're going to catch what you have in terms of disease or anything like that. But I can promise you, being disabled doesn't transmit anything when you have a physical disability. It's something that happened to you or something that you were born with. And what do you say or how do you greet a person with a disability? We just talked about that. But greet me as you would anybody else. Say, hello, how are you? How was your day? Um, how was your weekend? And yeah, I do a lot of stuff on the weekend with my family. And um, I, I'm engaged with my granddaughters. I get kisses every time they come, you know, to our home. So, you know, I operate the same way you did uh, in, in general. Uh, do you touch the wheelchair? The rule of thumb is on that is that you don't touch the chair, you don't grab it, because that's really personal space for a person with a disability. Sometimes when my grandchildren came over when they were younger, or my son was running around the house when he was younger, he would grab the hand control on my chair and send me flying into a wall just by mistake, because you know that was like a toy for him. So you really don't touch the wheelchair. And how do you help someone who is deaf or blind that those people will tell you what they need or a deaf person will write a note to you um, if he can't hear you. And there are people that understand sign language. So are there, there are ways to communicate. A person who is blind, you don't have to yell at them. You know, and some people do. I know that sounds funny or corny, but that happens. But a blind person will give you guidance on, you know, if you, and, and I've helped a blind person cross the street. And I say, sir, I'm in a wheelchair can I help you cross the street? I said, hang on to the back of my chair and walk across and I'll help you do that. So you just find ways to improvise. Don't get nervous. Don't get um, uh, antsy uh, if you want to engage someone with a wheelchair. Next slide, please. This story illustrates some of the anomalies in, in terms of uh, going out with your family or just going out with business friends, etc. Uh, my wife and I were coming back from a trip from Canada. My wife's Canadian and, and English. And we got over the border and we went to a restaurant near upstate New York. And when we got to the restaurant, we sat down and uh, my wife was on one end of the table. I was at the other. And my kids were separated as well at the table. So there were four of us. So the waiter comes in and says, hello, everyone, how are you? And he, he looks at my wife and he says, ma'am, what would you like to order? So my wife orders. Then he goes to my daughter, Danielle, and asks the same question, what would you like? And she gives her order. He moves over to my son and does the same thing. Then he looks back to my wife and says, what do you want to eat? What does he want to eat? And so there was like a pause for us. And my wife said, you better ask him because he's paying the bill. So this illustrates how people really don't know how to address a person with a disability. Don't think we're able to uh, be head of household, for example, or really don't know how to engage a person with a disability. And other waiters uh, in, in the past, in the future, that was probably the worst case scenario I had besides people ignoring us or uh, I, used, I, I heard whispers going into restaurants, oh, there's a wheelchair in here, uh, because it all seems to be disruptive to the able-bodied population. But I still go out, I do my thing, I go places, I tip well, I do all of that stuff to try to fit in with the able-bodied population. But I don't think that as, as much as we know about disability inclusion today, 
I don't think that we'll ever get to the point where we won't have issues in terms of understanding each other. So this is like a long-term thing that we all have to work on. If you are a person that supports disabilities or work in the disability space, you understand that. And it's, all, it's up to all of us to help people understand, you know, what's the difference? Why are we doing this? Why does it matter? And you could find that people with disabilities are as talented as anybody else is. Even my work at Chase, where we've hired thousands of people with disabilities over my six years at the bank, approved the fact that we can find people with disabilities and we can figure out how they can work in places at Chase. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Next slide. <clears throat> so disability is a worldwide reality now. And, and for me, as I coach this, there's a, a humanity challenge for all of us. There are 1 billion people with disabilities around the world. Uh, between 110 million and 190 million people experience significant disabilities. But let, let me say something about that. There are also, um, what should I say? Gates in terms of disability inclusion. Uh, disability inclusion is very different around the world. If, if you are in a poorer country or a less uh, prosperous country, disability inclusion gets worse. Um, I, I, I know stories of people in India and elsewhere, for example, in Africa, who are indigent and sit on the streets begging for, for money because they are disabled. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud of living in America where the standards are different. Um, and wherever you come from or where you've traveled to, disability inclusion is still a baseline that's uh, basically uh, mostly ignored, but there are a lot of efforts trying to help people move up the ranks. And when I hired people at Chase, they had to be qualified to work at Chase. And uh, you know, I would have loved to have hired more people than I, I saw, but we hired people that could work at the bank and do the jobs there. And so when you look at medium, small, um, and you know, top businesses, they're all categories of work that people would qualify for. So that's still a challenge in getting people to think about it that way. One in four adults in the US live with a disability. Um, I drove for a while before I retired. Uh, I drove for a long time. I drove to work, I traveled, I drove to Washington DC. When I lived in New York, I drove everywhere. Um, but you know, getting an accessible van is about $100,000 not that affordable for a lot of people. Uh, one in four adults live with a disability in the United States. And uh, you have uh, 20.4 million working age people that are working with disabilities. And a lot of them could be hidden disabilities. And so only about one third of our people have jobs. 80% of persons with disabilities live in developing countries. And so it's, it's a task that I think is gonna be never ending because Disabilities occur every day through accidents and other issues. And it's something we have to learn how to cope with and do a better job of. Next slide. My 80-20 rule for people with disabilities is just quite simple. I think that qualified people with disabilities who apply for your jobs have the skills you are looking for. And able-bodied people, and, and it, this is my just uh, number that you have 80% of the skill set when you apply for a, the job. Everybody, everybody then has to learn the other 20%. When I went to IBM, I had to learn what their strategy was, how they work, what they did. When I got the job at JP Morgan Chase and did it for the last six years, I had to do the same thing. I brought in 80% of my skill set and 20% I had to pick up and figure out what was going on with strategies outlooks, the marketplace, et cetera. And so the qualified people who apply for your jobs have a basic skill set, and, and that shows through the interviews. When you go through uh, uh, an interview process, I, I suggest that people tell the hiring managers what they have and what they need. The worst thing you could do is not tell anybody that 
you have a disability. I had uh, a chat with a woman at J.P. Morgan Chase, terrific lady. She came into my office and I knew she wanted to talk about disability because that's what I did. And she looked great, nice suit, nice hair. She looked perfect. And I sat down, I said, well, you know, glad to meet you. Um, I can't ask you, but you got to tell me what you want to talk about. And I knew it had to be about disability. And, and she told me that she had a disability, but she didn't want to tell her manager and she wanted to talk to me about that. And I said, well, why wouldn't you tell your manager that you have a disability and or may need some extra help through tools or aids or anything like that? Um, and she says, because I don't want my manager to hold it against me. So the, the nomenclature in the marketplace is that if you have a disability, you're less than and can't perform. And if you tell someone you have a disability, then people are afraid that that will be held against them. And sometimes it is. But I think in, in our new world of inclusion, I think we've got to do a better job of engaging people who are different, just trying to understand who they are. And I'm not talking about giving them extra help. I needed extra help because I couldn't get to a printer. I couldn't copy. I couldn't do things like that. That was like the manual labor stuff. But both at IBM, I didn't do disability inclusion at IBM. I was a communications executive, but I got my job done with help. And the idea for me is, Tell people what you need so you could work to the best of your ability. And some things just, you know, won't work. Like I couldn't open doors in some buildings. And I had uh, the, the bank and also IBM put in automatic doors so I can get through the wheelchair, so I can get the wheelchair through the business. So you ask politely, you, you collaborate with people, and you'll find that you get a, get a lot of people that want to help, that want to be part of the solution and not the problem. And so again, workers have 80% of what the job may require, just like anybody else. And when people with disabilities, deaf, blind, mobility impaired, neurodivergent, also need reasonable accomm accommodations. I manage the autism team at uh, JP Morgan Chase as, as well. And they had different needs and they had different learning curves. And so, there's no, how, how should I say, apparent answer for engaging with a person with a disability. It's, cert, it, it's a thing where you learn it on the job. You figure, it out, you figure out how to work with people, how to engage with people. But what the most essential uh, thing is, you start with what you have in common. We have a lot of commonality in terms of people with disabilities, and the differences are are. I would, I would say slight because you can engage in a, in a marketplace, in an office with other people. Uh, you could be a, uh, a person working in retail and still help people um, as able-bodied people do, but you've just got to find the way that's right to do it. I never put people or hired people in jobs that they couldn't do, disabled or not. The idea is fig figuring out what the right place is, the right time, and what the right skill set is. And when I got to a Chase, I did start up an accessibility program where technology really uh, provided assistive technology for all of our, our people that needed it for disabilities. And that took a lot of work, and the investment was, was in the millions of dollars as we did that at the bank. And I was very proud of what J.P. Morgan did as well as IBM did in, in this space. But this can be done if you just put your mind to it and have a strategy and think about it rationally. Next slide, please. The, the question, and we, I talked about this a little earlier, is here's what not to say to a person with a disability. No matter how impressed you are with that person, and I've heard all of these, by the way, you are too young, too pretty intelligent to have a disability. They're trying to compliment you, but it doesn't come off quite well, right? The, I, the idea for me is just like, tell them who you are, what you want to talk about, what you, and I do the same thing. And I, I really tell them uh, when I see people nervous, I tell them I'm a quadriplegic. I broke my neck surfing and um, I, I can't use my hands, but other than that, we're good to go. 
So I'm not afraid to introduce myself and, and tell them what I can do and what I can't do. The other thing I hear is that, well, Jim, you're sitting in a wheelchair, but it, that's not as serious as another person. That's exactly the wrong thing to say. Every disability is debilitating to somebody, whether you're blind, deaf, and even in the disabled community, I hear people say, I'd rather be blind than mobility impaired, or I'd rather be deaf, or, you know, but, you know, I, the real answer is you don't have a choice about your disability. If it happens, you have only chose to say, how can I do the best that I can with this disability? Um, the other thing is, I've had people that, that really care. And instead of asking if I need help, they go out and say, Jim, let me take off your jacket. And they grab my jacket. I said, no, 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 no. I leave my jacket on. So some people do that out of nervousness or not knowing the etiquette or just wanting to help. And I don't get angry at them because I, I understand what they're trying to do. So the disability individual, the person with the disability has an obligation to help other people. Now, I've had arguments with people in my community about disabled, and I've got what I call a radical end that says, you know what, I don't, I don't want them to help me, and I'll tell them that. And because some people with disabilities have a chip on their shoulder because we're disabled, and it just takes time for us to get over it. And, and as in reality, some people never get over it. Um, I've heard people tell me I'm inspiring. I don't feel inspired. I'm, I'm just trying to do my job like everybody else is and trying to share a new construct of engagement with all of us. Uh, because when you think about it, so you have a 70% chance of becoming disabled in your lifetime uh, as you age, as things happen, et cetera. And so I'm not, I'm not saying you're gonna be disabled in your lifetime, but as you get older, things just change. I have another line there. You don't look like you have a disability. I've heard them say that to other people that are able-bodied walking around, but may be deaf, may have low vision issues or other issues, or may have tremors, et cetera. Everyone has some kind of disability. I think that's true, but that's patronizing. I mean, you don't have to comment on my disability, just like I shouldn't comment on how you look or how you dress or how you comb your hair. And again, I get the, the, the fist pump uh, point. You can achieve anything you strive to do. Well, I think that's, that's a nice uh, thing to aspire to. I'm not so sure that's completely true. But again, some of these statements are patronizing. I don't, I, I don't think you're a bad person if you do this. But now that you understand a little bit about it, I, I'd say engage people as you would want to be engaged with. And if you do it that way, you'll be fine. And if you have a question to say, hey, Jim, or hey, Mary, you know, what can I do to help you? Is there anything you need? Uh, that always ask the question politely. Don't force it. And don't touch, um, you know, um, unless you're doing, if you're shaking hands, and almost say, may I shake hands? Just ask the question and please don't get offended if I've met people with disabilities that are jerks too. So that happens. Um, and then we move on from that. Next slide, please. These are the five A's that I created at IBM. I did, I did the four A's first and then we added five at Chase. The, the fifth was the accountability, which is in the middle of this chart. So assimilate, assimilation talked about how do you bring in qualified people with disabilities into your business? It's sort of like, how do you assimilate women? How do you assimilate Black, Hispanic, Native American? How do you bring people in with different cultures? And that happens across the board. Attitude at the top there really talks about how do you think about uh, your DEI, serve your uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion policies. How do you create a business-wide environment with the right business strategy, the attitude to recruit, hire, retain, and advance the careers of people and people with disabilities? Too often, people hire a person with a disability, but never think about them in terms of leadership. We want to become leaders if we have the skills. And sometimes we're turned down because of that. And sometimes we don't even know we're turned down, even though we have the skills, but People prefer not to have a person in a wheelchair or blind, et cetera, or deaf. 
because it's always I, I've heard they complain about it, you know. So this is going to take time, and that's the attitudinal uh, part of this accountability. Accommodations was one of the first thing we set up at the bank and at IBM. They did that as well. How do you eliminate barriers? How do you talk to your real estate teams to make sure that you have ramps instead of stairs or elevators or braille on elevator doors? Or how do you build a building that's more accessible? And one of the things I left behind at Chase was our new office building that's going to open up in a year or two now is all fully accessible, I'm told, by my real estate team. I work very closely with real estate, with legal, um, with technology. I, I worked with everyone that could help eliminate barriers and make the bank as accessible as possible. And on the bottom, the accessibility is that we establish business-wide policies and strategies that ensure reasonable accessibility standards. So I wrote a policy letter or a standard for the bank in terms of disability inclusion. Now, even though I retired from the bank, you know, two months ago, that policy is still in place at the bank and hopefully it's gonna have the longevity to stay there. And, and what we did with that policy letter um, that I, I wrote along with communication is that it remains with the bank, you know, forever. As long as the bank lasts, that policy will last. And, what I wrote the policy for, not for people with disabilities, but for managers. Because managers come in and they have to do the hiring and they go, damn it, I got to hire a person with a disability who came in. And, you know, and they come in as candidates like anybody else. And they've got to be considered competitively as well. So the idea is I try to make it easier for managers to hire and help them feel that because they hired with a person with a disability that may fail in the job, it's not the manager's fault. So the idea is how do you get people comfortable with this? How do you work with it in the environment? And you give permission to people to hire so they're not taking a risk. And that's what this was all about. At the end of the day, this is all about account accountability. If you don't you know, watch what you do, you could set up policies but you got to make sure they get uh, executed. And one of the biggest things that I found that helped me was uh, Jamie Dimon interviewed me for my interview uh, with the bank. I did 16 interviews before I was hired. And I asked them why I've never done 16 interviews before. Before Once I was hired, I got interviewed with Jamie Dimon and the rest of the bank at the top of the business. So they knew this new guy coming in doing disability inclusion is going to work around the world for this. And I think the bank did a great job in, in setting that up and getting us where we, we finally went. But that took work. It took commitment. It also took um, vision on the folks to try to do this. And not all, not all people with disabilities are the same. So when you're looking to hire people with disabilities, make sure they're able to do that job make sure you're able to help them do the job with accommodations or whatever else you need. You got to do some pre-planning there because like, like me, I don't want to hire someone and make that investment and they'll fail. Um, and I don't think that, you know, we all have a chance where there's some failure, but the best businesses do as good a job as possible to keep their people, train them and help them and make sure they're the right fit for your job and what you wanna do. And also make sure you have the patience to work with those people once they get into your business. Next, next slide, please. So when you embrace the new area of disability inclusion, um, it's no longer about automatic doors, curb cuts, ramps, and le legislation. This is, that, was, that was essential at the time in terms of thinking about that, but now we've got to say, we have all these helping uh, laws. We, we have the accommodation. So how do we look at that and, and make people with disabilities normalized in the 20th and 21st century to include them into work? Because people with disabilities want to work as much as anybody can. It's just finding the right fit. So today, the new era of disability inclusion is about assimilation. We hiring professionals with disabilities into the uh, re 
robust culture of the firm or your marketplace. And you need leadership here because there's always going to be naysayers. I've, I've had them all my life. You can't do that. You can't do this. It's not going to happen. And But you just got to push and pull. And I think you can embrace a new uh, era of disability inclusion. And this is not a feel sorry for you play. I had to hire people that were qualified to do the work. And that's the key. Are they qualified to do the work? Next slide, please. And so I want to give a, a nod to the Americans with Disability Act. Um, the ADA has really uh, enabled us to really change the world, change America, and make people with disabilities uh, a part of our country. You know, for too long, uh, we were kept in institutions. My injury, maybe you know, 40 years ago would mean that I could never go out and I'd probably have to live in an institution to be cared for. But a lot of things have changed. And so uh, if you haven't looked at the ADA and its title, take a look at it because it's a great opportunity to understand what the mission was and, and how that's taking hold in America and around the world. Um, and there's a lot more to disability inclusion than this summary that I gave you, but I wanted to give you a feel for what this was like and, and the results that we had at both IBM and at Chase and around the world. And thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions. Jim, thank you so much for your time today. And um, again, sorry that for our technical difficulties at first, but um, we are excited to hear from you and appreciate you. We do have some questions. Um, the first question that we have, Jim, is what is your experience with people who have invisible disabilities? Do you find they have a more difficult time obtaining accommodations through employers? And have you found any strategies that will help these individuals get accommodations? That's a great question. And, um, you, you know, people with disabilities are tenant, like, I'm, let, let me say this, I'm an old timer with a disability. So I've lived through it, I've done it, I've failed, I've been hurt, I've been challenged, and that's part of the play for people with disabilities. And so I, I think given meetings like this, uh, companies like Chase and IBM that supported people with disabilities, you know, I'm not saying there's a re renaissance going on now, but it, it, it's a beginning for all of us in terms of being able to change and take interest in this. The investment, unfortunately, is high initially uh, when you make a, uh, a quest to hire people with disabilities because there's a lot of things you don't know. And I had to make some things up. I had a, uh, I learned from what we did at IBM. I came up with my own strategies. And my first point, and I think it should be codified for all of us is you've got to engage with people with uh, uh, who are different in terms of a work environment or even society if you want to make progress and I think that's how you do it we learn from each other we talk like my son calls me dad my daughter calls me dad my granddaughters call me papa none of them mention my disability none of them mention my wheelchair and that's where we want to go and once you start getting over that image of a disabled person and go into the emotional part or the respectful part of treating people with humanity, that's what makes sense. And that's what moves the bar, at least to me. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, do you have any strategies for encouraging applicants or existing employers to disclose their disability it's hard to provide accommodations if the applicant doesn't share. That's a, another great point. And we did, a, I, one of my main, let me say this, besides the people that hired me, my main partner was my communications colleagues. Because through that, we set up a construct in terms of what the bank and IBM believed in, how we felt about people with disabilities, and I'm very candid about disability inclusion in my role when I was there as a managing director. I, I tell people, look, 
um, Jim Sanaki, I'm quadriplegic. Here's what I can do. Here's what I can't do. And hopefully that opened it up for other people. Now, there are many people that have hidden disabilities that won't share it. And when I've talked to them about it, they said, Jim, every time I did that, someone held it against me. Because when you reveal, they an able-bodied person, and this is one of the definitions of ableism, is that you're less than. And we've got to get over that. On the other hand, a person with a disability has to really showcase their skills and be that business person or whatever you are, a salesperson, and, and show them that you have ways to uh, navigate obstacles, solve problems, come up with ideas, um, and that'll be helpful. You, you, you prove yourself along the way because there'll always be naysayers. Um, and the naysayers is a kind word, but then there's also the people that will discriminate you because they don't like dealing with you, you move too slow, or you look funny, or whatever the hell it is. But you've got to just stay in the place and kind of showcase what you can do. It's still a, it's still a, I don't want to say it's a, it's a battle, but it's about good behavior should uh, reciprocate with, with good behavior. Just get to know people. And that's hard for a lot of us. Um, and, and Jim, you and I have had some, some conversations with our team about ensuring uh, that there are good narratives or stories set up for applicants or existing employees when they come in that maybe they might find themselves in? I think that's right. I think that's true. One, one of the, the, and you know this story because I, I, I shared it with you and your team earlier, but I'll share it with this audience. When I was at, at Chase, I was in the, the job two years. And of course, I got a lot of promotion uh, in terms of media and stuff like that internal to the bank. And a mother wrote to me after seeing a story of myself and my service dog, Veronique, um, in my office. And the mother was reading the story to her child, which, which was a boy about 10 years old. And she said, Jim, I, I read your story to my son. And he, and he asked me the darndest question. And he said, Mom, I see that man in a wheelchair with his dog. Does that mean I can go to work someday? And like that kind of grabbed me. And this happened like five years ago, and I still remember it. Even a child knows they're disabled and knows they're different. And my job is to give that child hope that he or she can engage like anybody else can. And that's the things that keep me going in terms of talking about this. Your children know they know they're different and they also know that they want to figure out how to engage later in life. And they're thinking about it. This boy was 10. They're thinking about it that early because they know they're different. Um, uh, last question. Um, and then we will, any of the other questions that we have, we'll make sure we get addressed and sent to folks is, um, how are companies helping individuals with mental health conditions that fall under ADA? Well, you know, we had an autism program. Uh, our, our company, our medical team also talked about mental health and mental illness at the bank. Uh, we had stories go out. And one of, the, one of the things we really did well was communicate. And we communicated about disability inclusion. We communicated the successes, the challenges, and we talked about people actually interviewed around the world with us, telling us their conditions. They came out. They talked about mental illness. They talked about disability inclusion. They talked about neurodiversity. They talked about everything. So our, our companies had a narrative around disability inclusion that was fine. And people actually took photos of, with their stories showing their disability, where they work, what they did. And that became a culture uh, pleaser in terms of knowing that people are different at the bank and they're working there. And that was just wonderful. We had thousands of, of views on our stories with disability inclusion. Number one, uh, it's a good business story and it, and it denotes a business change. On number two, 
it really speaks to the humanity of the company that's touting that. So we're normalizing it that way. So at the bank, it was normalized, right? I'm not saying it was perfect because there were issues that weren't good, but uh, things happened. Mm -hmm. Jim, we really appreciate you. We appreciate your time and most importantly, your expertise. And um, we are out of time for questions right now. But for um, everybody online still with us today, you can please feel free to contact me um, via email, which we'll see here in a second. But make sure if you, oh, there you go. Make sure that you're following us on our social media channels and on our website. We'll make sure that the webinar is posted soon. Um, I want to thank you again, Jim. I want to thank Tina and everybody that has joined us today. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.